Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Gerard Toll. I'm a professor at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs in the Greater Washington area. And this is a brief lecture on um, political ecology. And um, so I'm going to use uh, Paul Robbins's book, Political Ecology, a critical introduction to help explain what the concept is, what it does. Uh, I'm very fond of this book. Uh, it is in its third edition, 2020. Previously, there was a second edition, 2012, and I believe the first edition was a 2005 of this book. Now, who is a Paul um, Robbins? Well, Paul Robbins is uh, the Dean of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin. And he is someone who is uh, a, a trained as a geographer. He has a master's and a PhD in geography. But interestingly, he has an undergraduate degree in, um, in anthropology. Now, um, political ecology. So the concept of political ecology is one that has merged over the last three, four decades. Uh, it is one that is multidisciplinary, but I guess it's anchored most closely, or most closely associated with the discipline of geography and anthropology um, and development studies. Um, it addresses the politics of the use of nature. Um, Geographers are concerned with human environment relations and uh, are working in that tradition. Uh, and there's lots of different uh, conceptualizations of how humans have used the environment. Um, so political ecology is a reaction to previous uh, conceptualizations, as I'll explain. But um, what makes political ecology distinctive is that it is an emphasis on how the relationship that humans have with the environment is shaped by power. It's shaped by culture, it's shaped by the particular structures that humans have established uh, across the planet. And the major structure uh, that political ecologists address is capitalism. Uh, now capitalism is simple to say, but actually what that means in practice in particular places uh, has to be uh, determined, it has to be documented, has to be empirically investigated. Um, as uh, Paul notes in the book, a political ecology is not a method or a theory or even a, a single perspective. It's sort of gather, a gathering place for um, various types of uh, what he calls texts. And this, these are uh, academic studies, but they also can be reports. They can also be videos and uh, more activist uh, types of engagements. But it is an urgent argument. So there is a, a definite self a recognized politics to the particular activity in as much as they're a, the a particular people that are involved in political ecology are seeking to make an argument and an argument which they consider urgent. Uh, so it's an urgent a, a argument that examines a winners and losers. In other words, it looks at power structures. Um, and a, in particular, it's looking at the unevenness of human vulnerability, the hidden costs, the differential power geometries that are at work when we study how humans are using the environment and how the ways in which humans use the environment, the particular structures that shape that uh, are damaging to the environment and also to humans. So it, it is a particular a perspective uh, or a particular disposition, not a single perspective, uh, which narrates this, um, this particular problematic, this particular subject area uh, using dialectics. 
So it begins and ends with the understandings of contradictions. And this sometimes can be difficult to grasp, but essentially they are uh, political ecologies defined by a relational ontology. So it doesn't see things in an atomistic ways. It doesn't think in sort of mechanical causality. It rather looks at the ways in which there are, uh, things are connected uh, to each other and uh, in ways that are uh, challenging to map. Uh, but one of the things that uh, a lot of political ecologists are looking for is the particular instabilities, the particular uh, tensions that characterize the power relations. And the biggest uh, of these, of course, is the relationship between humans and the environment and the ways in which humans have altered the environment in ways that are now rebounding uh, in very dramatic ways. Uh, against humans, against human society, and against um, the particular formations, the terror formations, the infrastructures that humans have built, the societies uh, that humans have built uh, uh, over the last uh, 2,000 uh, plus years. Um, so political ecology perspective researches uh, the objective and material status of nature. So there is a commitment to science and hard science and, and material, uh, um, uh, documenting the material. Uh, but it's also attentive to particular narratives and culture and symbols and stories about nature and human environment relations because the objective, na the, the objective uh, features of the world, like the fact that we are now in a world that is going above 1.5 degrees Celsius surface temperature for the first time ever in human history, that uh, is a function of the stories that humans have told about the environment and their relationship to the environment. So the material world around us is impacted by the ways in which cultures, power structures, tell stories, conceptualize uh, nature, and conceptualize the relationships of human beings to that uh, nature. It takes a hatchet and seed approach, uh, in a hatchet in the sense of this is its critique, it's the uh, seeking to uncover uh, and expose the power structures that shape particular outcomes. Uh, but there's also the seed of uh, making the arguments that things could be different, that things do not necessarily need to be the way that they are, that these are structures which are created by humans and can be undone by humans, uh, even though we're now in a world which is very much shaped by past actions and the legacy of those past actions. So it is a, a recognition that politics is inevitably ecological, as, and also that ecology is inherently political. So that's why the emphasis is on the, on the political, why the, the word political there. I do not take it as uh, it ne necessarily means, therefore people have an ax to grind. No, they're seeking to make an argument. And this is a social science. Uh, now there are activist dimensions to it, but it is in its best form a social science making sets of arguments which are uh, which are better than uh, the alternative arguments. It is a community of practice united around a certain kind of text as he uh, he argues. So that's a, a way in which you can conceptualize it. Now, what are the things that it's reacting against? Well, it's reacting against a political ecology. Um, but the, it's an apolitical ecology that didn't see itself as political, but in actual practice was. Um, the first reaction is against the deterministic tradition of conceptualizing the relationship between humans and the environment. Um, and so, for example, we have a book here. I have this book, uh, Ellsworth Huntington's book, Civilization and Climate, um, which... Uh, was um, it went through multiple uh, editions first published in 1915 and then again in 1922 by Yale University Press um, and it essentially makes a uh, racial environmental arguments about uh, how climate shapes the degree to which people are energetic or not 
how temperature and like hot temperatures makes people lazy uh, and the relationship of a uh, work to weather uh, and so on and so forth. This was a form of scientific racism um, and it was not it was in our culture not too long ago and there's still uh, resi resi residual aspects of this in our culture uh, residues of it all over the place. So Political ecology is an argument against the deterministic arguments uh, that characterized uh, geography and environmental science at the beginning of the 20th century uh, and, and the racism that accompanied that. Um, now, there was a reaction in the 1920s and 1930s against that human society uh, um, research which emphasized possibilism of the same environment uh, can lead to very different human ecologies. And you had early scientific geography, and he discusses this in the book, uh, going back to the 18th century, uh, which was actually more progressive in lots of ways than what came in the uh, end of the 19th century, um, which was shaped by Darwinism and shaped by so uh, social Darwinism, a sort of very race, uh, uh, racist conceptualization of uh, Darwin's work. Um, but there is also an anarchist tradition within a geography which is much more uh, progressive in its conceptualizations of how humans um, uh, are in, in, in the environment because it's attentive to human variety and it's based upon actual empirical research. Uh, Humboldt, uh, Reclus, uh, uh, Kropotkin, Wallace, uh, uh, and others going actually out into the uh, world and doing research. Uh, then there's the discussion of uh, how in the 1950s and the 1960s you had the development uh, of hazards research and urban ecology, as well as cultural ecology, which comes out of the work of Carl Sauer, who is uh, a very famous geographer uh, that was established in Berkeley. And he really focused in on the landscape and the morphology of the landscape and the ways in which humans shape the landscape uh, on the basis of their uh, kind of cultural backgrounds and how they used it. There the emphasis in, in that uh, cultural geography and then also ecological anthropology was very much on function, adaptation, there was energy flow analysis within a... a uh, ecological anthropology within cultural geography and cultural ecology there was an emphasis on sort of visual forms and uh, on the sort of the documentation of the landscape without too much attentiveness attentiveness to the uh, empirics of power uh, and how power really shaped this um, but there are limits to this sort of progressive uh, contextualization uh, and it was in a kind of response to um, the late Cold War uh, and to um, a post-colonial moment from the 1960s onwards that you had the development of a political ecology. Now, political ecology uh, draws upon a series of different uh, um, traditions. So it's a kind of coming together of... Um, First of all, a concern with the uh, common property theory, the ways in which uh, there is uh, an understanding of how humans uh, um, exploit the earth. Uh, there are limits to that. There's a sort of Mal neo-Malthusian moment in the 1970s on the limits to growth, which emphasizes uh, the fact that there's overpopulation or alleged overpopulation within the world uh, and there's a tragedy of the commons and, and so on and so forth. That proved to be extremely inadequate because it didn't ask, well, actually, um, there are massive asymmetries in terms of who is actually uh, using the resources. Uh, and so one American is using uh, as many resources as uh, 100,000 Indians. Uh, so therefore, does that, uh, is that a problem of overpopulation? What does it mean to say there's a problem of overpopulation? Because it seemed that particular rhetoric was always one which 
invented or at least conceptualized overpopulation as a problem out there in the third world rather than a problem uh, which really had to do with the distribution of resources. Uh, I, the political ecology is very much shaped by Marxist political economy, historical materialism, the emphasis on uh, extractivism. Um, it also is uh, emphasis on uh, dependency, accumulation and degradation. Uh, and in particular, I want to draw attention to a uh, metabolic rift theory, which has developed over the last uh, number of years. Uh, and this is a particular uh, argument which is made by John Bellamy Foster in this book, which is a reading of Karl Marx and his uh, conceptualization of capitalism and how capitalism uh, exploits not simply workers, uh, but it actually is based first and foremost on the um, uh, exploitation of the earth. Uh, and so he argues that Marx theorized a particular rupture in the metabolic interaction. When, when they say metabolic, it has to do with energy flows. It has to do with where we get food, where we get that which uh, sustains us. Um, and so he uh, uses the term metabolic rift in which you have uh, a significant jump in the forms of uh, extraction and uh, energy uh, regimes in the uh, Industrial Revolution onwards. And that is then uh, theorized by other people like uh, Andreas Malm, the rise of steam power and the roots of global warming. Um, so all of these uh, issues are uh, taken up by sociologists and writers. This book here seeks to uh, look at the ways in which you have extractivism as, and colonialism as really central to the origins of the environmental crisis that we face right now. So Marx's political economy is really fundamental to political ecology, but it's not only Marxist and in some instances, some versions of it, because it's a heterogeneous field, are not necessarily Marxist at all. Um, there, there's an also a drawing upon peasant studies uh, and this emphasis on a, a sort of history from below and a conceptualization not of peasants as uh, people who are uh, sort of backward uh, and who are uh, the opposite of modernizers, but instead an understanding of them as cautious, rational producers. Uh, there's also studies from James Scott, E.P. Thompson's work on moral economies and how there was um, a, a relationship between uh, indigenous communities and peasants uh, and how they used the land. And that was mediated by, by religious cosmologies, but also ways of doing things, habits, understandings as to what was appropriate, what was not appropriate. And those moral economies are extremely important to understand and grasp. And us from the modernizing world uh, have done a poor job of, of conceptualizing that. So part of what the anthropologist slash geographer does is to kind of go back into that and be extremely attentive to those kind of habits of conceptualization and understanding. Um, there a uh, um, political ecology has been informed by feminist political ecology, which emphasizes uh, the gendered work regimes that are found uh, in how humans use the environment uh, and the ways in which there are particular gender divisions of labor and how they uh, work themselves out. And then there's also a greater emphasis on performativity and intersectionality, which has to do with the particular uh, uh, emergence of those issues within our increasingly diverse uh, and open society. Um, while uh, feminists have also brought a, an emphasis on to the everyday, rather than looking at a simply major uh, firms 
uh, and looking at a sort of top-down conceptualization of political ecology, which is important to do. I mean, don't get me wrong, that's also important. But the, uh, there is a sort of bottom-up quality to political ecology that's very, very important. Fifthly, post-colonial studies, uh, which, in a, which has an emphasis on um, a ecological imperialism. And here I, I should mention the book by... Um, um, by Alfred Crosby, Ecological Imperialism, which was a, a it's a, a study of the Colombian encounter and the ways in which Europe uh, simply didn't colonize with people uh, the New World. It also colonized it with plants and with animals uh, and with disease uh, as well. And so there's an emphasis on the ecological dimensions of imperialism, as well as the ways in which uh, imperialism was an ecological project to sort of seize land and completely transform it to serve the interests of, um, of Europe. Um, so that's a, a, a particular inspiration. Foucault and his emphasis on governmentality, sort of ways in which uh, government structures then lead to habits of doing things ways of thinking about the world, ways of conceptualizing the of nature and the environment as a sort of a set of resources in a very instrumentalized, short-term way, and conceptualizing the earth as dead, uh, as merely stuff. That is part of uh, what is studied too. Timothy Mitchell's work on colonial governance in Egypt and then on oil is important here. The classificatory systems that are used, the, the work of uh, Cronin on uh, Chicago uh, uh, as a particular sort of network of feeding this particular city uh, and uh, um, the, the book Nature's Metropolis, uh, the ways in which the city is this organism of sorts the the particular when you think of the metabolic the metaphor of the organism is one that is that comes to mind but it has negative or it has essentially qualities that can lead to abuse so we need to be very uh, careful about how we use that particular metaphor um, then lastly actor networks and new materialism which uh, comes from the work of Bruno Latour uh, and then uh, Jane Bennett and those associated with new materialism where there's an emphasis on objects and then on the agency of the uh, of nature itself how nature does things how nature uh, sort of creates constraints creates a uh, ways in which you can enroll and not enroll in particular political economies and then of course creates these blockages and uh, resistances uh, and uh, undoes some of the uh, particular challenges that, uh, that economies uh, face and that societies face and are playing themselves out right now. Um, then uh, let me end by talking about the five big questions in political uh, ecology. So the apolitical ecology that he seeks to uh, distance itself from, uh, that, that political ecology seeks to distance itself from, uh, are this uh, um, limits to growth, this idea of eco-scarcity, and then this idea of ecological modernization, that simply we can continue to modernize, continue to grow uh, the economy without any uh, check, uh, that there's simply um, going to be an inexhaustible uh, earth available for us. Um, an emphasis on power geometries, an emphasis on scale and scalar relationships between global markets and local realities, an emphasis on winners and losers, things that are seen and unseen in the economy and the pollution is often unseen uh, because it is hard to measure uh, and it, it, it only erupts in the forms of sicknesses. Uh, much later. So there's a very temporalities here. Uh, there's a costing, for example, a commodity is costed in a certain way, but then the real costs of that commodity and its production, uh, and it's then uh, eventually uh, conversion into waste, 
is not taken into consideration. So we don't have real cost economics. So that's again a question of visibilities and invisibilities interacting with temporalities here. So the five big themes that he discusses in the different chapters, degradation and marginalization, conservation and control, environment conflict and exclusion, uh, and then subjectivities and identities associated with environmental conflicts, uh, and then lastly, political objects and actors. Um, this is a very rich book. This whole domain is extremely rich. Uh, and so I hope you enjoy working your way through this book and beginning to get into a political ecology uh, because I think it's a very productive way of thinking about um, the world around us and the particular crises that we face uh, in the world right now, most especially the uh, climate crisis. Okay, thank you.